Katherine Stovesick. I'm with the Ann Springs Close Greenway, and today for our speaker series, we're talking with Fort Mill native Jared Funderburk about beekeeping. Um, so let us know that you're here with your likes and your loves and all your little emojis. And if you have questions, place those in the comments, and we will do our best to answer them for you. So without further ado, here is Jared. Hey, Jared. Hello. Welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming and uh, joining us today to learn a little bit about bees. I'm really excited and happy to share my knowledge with you. Um, in no ways am I like the master beekeeper, but I think this is my fourth year uh, beekeeping, so I've learned a lot and I'm super interested in it and happy to share with you what, uh, what I know. So um, today what we're going to do is focus just on a few subjects. So we're going to focus on um, why bees are important. Um, most people, I think, are starting to understand that now, but if you don't, uh, maybe we can help make that a little clearer for you. So why bees are important, uh, what it takes to have an apiary of your own, um, and I'll delve into some of the mechanics of it, and the bee species themselves are very interesting, mind-blowing to me. And then just kind of wrap it up on like, uh, what you could do in your community to support pollinators because they're very important too and we'll talk more about that later but um, as you can see we're here in my yard it's a beautiful day i'm very thankful to have this wonderful spot to uh, be outdoors during these times and uh, also i spend a lot of time at the greenway so i do want to take one moment anytime i get to to do this i like to thank the ann springs close greenway for what they've given to our community here in Fort Mill. And I always like to thank Miss Ann Springs Close herself personally, because we wouldn't have the Greenway if it wasn't for her. And if you go look at a lot of these other towns that are booming like Fort Mill, you won't find 2,300 acres of green space to ride your mountain bike, hike, kayak, horseback ride, all of that. So thank you. I love it and I spend lots of time there. So um, behind me here, I have uh, one hive in my garden. You can see in the distance, the white boxes. Uh, just behind a peach tree here that's grown up over the past few years. And here I have basically most of my hive parts, um, the hive body, the frames, my smoker, my suit. So what we can do is we can start down here and I'll just kind of uh, build a beehive for you and show you all of the parts. Okay, uh, I think right now beekeeping is becoming very popular to say much more popular than it has been. Um, and that's a great thing because we need to support our pollinators. Um, but it's, it's also important that we be knowledgeable and know that we're doing it the right way. Um, and make sure that we keep it about the bees and their health and well-being, not so much about what we want. Because a lot of times humans try to put the natural world um, in their way or see it through their perspective, but uh, it's best to learn as much as you can about bees so and, and kind of let them do their thing. Uh, my approach to beekeeping and my best friends here in Fort Mill who um, we learn a lot together, we try to not over manage our hives and we try to let the bees do kind of what they do. It's easy to sit and think, well, I could do this and I could add that or maybe they need this. But sometimes uh, it's best to just trust they know what they're doing. So let's get started here. Um, this first object here is a screen bottom board, okay? So basically, uh, just a piece of wood has this metal screen mesh here. And this is the entrance. This is going to be the entrance of the hive, or some people call this like the landing pad. And you'll see this wire mesh. Um, there are different types, but this is kind of a typical type you'll see in lots of hives. You can see, um, if I turn this over, you can see where I've used this bottom board before, and you can see some propolis here, which is like bee glue. Um, they'll use that to seal up the hive and uh, create the right airflow, keep themselves warm or cool. Like I said, they know what they're doing, so I kind of like to trust them in a lot of things. So here's our bottom board. Now, next we have a deep super or a brood box, a lot of people call it. Um, so this is where, this is gonna be just for the bees, all right? So this, uh, a brood, brood box means that's where they're laying their eggs and multiplying. So this box is going to be left just for the bees, all right? So 
Inside the brood box, you will find frames. All right, this is a 10 frame box. You can get eight frame boxes, uh, different sizes, but this is a 10 frame box. And this is a typical frame with drawn out comb on it. Okay, so this has been used. Um, when the bees first draw this comb out, it'll just be pure white and beautiful clean, but over uh, throughout the seasons, it'll start to get darker like this. And then after a couple years, it's best to kind of cycle out your frames uh, and keep them fresh. But this is a good frame with drawn out comb. This is probably one of the most valuable things in beekeeping because if you have drawn out comb, to, uh, to give your bees immediately, say you catch a swarm or you get a package of bees, the, the queen can go in and start laying eggs in here immediately. Whereas if you get a package of bees and you are starting out like I was a few years ago, then you will only have this wax foundation. So obviously this is man-made. It has wires here that kind of reinforce it. But this just gives something for the bees to work off of. And if you look closely, you'll see the little um, hexagons here that help them to start the comb. And it's the same on both sides. They'll build the comb out straight from there. And uh, it just kind of helps them get started. There are different types of foundation. I typically use the wax foundation. Some people even use like plastic and different options. Um, so. If you put your bees in with just foundation, you, you have to realize they have to draw out the comb first, which if you have a big uh, swarm or a lot of bees, they can do that pretty quickly. I mean, they can draw out comb in a, in a medium super like this. If they're really working to full potential in about a week, that's 10 frames. But um, you start with this. So if you, if you get a swarm of bees or a package of bees and you put them in with just foundation, they're gonna start off in a decline because the queen, first they're gonna have to build that comb and then that'll take uh, a week or so and then the queen has to lay eggs in there and then it takes 21 days for worker bees to hatch from an egg. Um, 24 days for a drone and 16 or 17 days for a queen. All right, so. Jared, yeah. can you explain, and if you're doing that later, that's great, the difference between the, the worker bees, the drones, the queen, who yeah, all the players yeah. are? Yeah, so uh, you have three types. You have the queen bee, which is obviously the most important. Without the queen, you won't have a colony of bees. And uh, that's another term that gets kind of thrown around, a colony. So the actual group of bees is called a colony. And this box here that we have created, this is a Langstroth hive. So this hive revolutionized beekeeping. I think uh, it was 1852 when these hives were um, developed and because they have the removable frames and um, Langstroth came up with uh, the proper bee spacing so these these frames are spaced apart just right so the bees will build that comb out and you can take it out and harvest the honey so you have the queen um, queens take about 16 17 days uh, from an egg to a hatched queen and how do queen how do they make a queen or a drone or a worker i can explain that uh, in just a second but workers take um, 21 days to develop and drones take 24. drones i can get through that quickly because uh, drones serve one purpose basically to mate the queen um, otherwise they don't do much they don't do much work they just kind of eat uh, the food and sustenance that the other bees have collected so you'll find in winter time um, they'll run the drones out and they won't they won't create any more drones because they're just kind of wasting the food source that helps them get through the winter. So, you know, the males are basically just used for uh, mating purpose. So worker bees, very important too. Worker bee takes 21 days to develop. Um, a queen can lay in this hive. She'll just tuck her abdomen down into the, um, the cell here and drop an egg. She can lay over 2000 eggs in one day. Um, on average, they estimate a queen, a healthy queen, lays around 1,500 eggs a day. So the cycle of bees' life is a quick thing. Worker bees live typically around six weeks in the summer when they're working hard. During the nectar flow, which is going on right now with the tulip poplar mainly, um, worker bees may only live three weeks. 
and they literally work themselves to death and what happens is they'll just wear their wings out and you can even see bees that are just worn out and their wings start to fall apart and they can't fly anymore so the worker bee um, the first part of their life they spend in the hive as a house worker and their job is to meet the bees uh, they'll, they'll first clean out the hive and clean out the cells and and feed younger um, pupa and larvae and then well larvae and then um, the second stage of their life they will become a field worker and so the field workers are going out and they're foraging they're bringing four things into the hive they bring nectar into the hive they bring water into the hive they bring pollen and they bring uh, propolis and propolis is something they make that's that bead glue um, that you see here along these edges or if I show you on this top screen here you see more of that propolis and if it warms up you know it's kind of pliable if it gets cold it hardens but it's really sticky and bees will um, basically get the sap from trees and they mix that with saliva and um, create this and also some of the let's see saliva sap and one other ingredient can't think of that right now but anyway that's problem so the, the worker bee will go out and forage and they bring back uh, nectar and pollen to feed the rest of the colony and they bring water um, honey is made basically by putting the nectar into these cells and then the worker bees will fan that nectar to get rid of the, the water. So once it becomes a certain amount, the right consistency of nectar, and, and they fan it to dry out the right amount of water, it becomes a perfect amount, it's honey, and then they cap it off and seal it up. And honey really never goes bad. It's, that's one thing that makes me know the importance of bees because they create honey which never goes bad. Like we have we can see evidence that native people have been um, harvesting honey and even controlling bee populations for thousands of years. Um, I think they found honey in King Tut's tomb, which is like 3,500 years old, and the honey's still edible. So, worker bees spend their first part of life as house bees working in the hive. A foraging bee will come in, a field worker will come in, with their honey stomach full of that nectar and that's what they're doing right now and they will transfer that to a house worker and then the house worker will take that nectar and put it in the cell uh, they're very smart i mean they know what they're doing there's a lot going on in the hive that you wouldn't realize and then as i said the queen is the most important one uh, queens live on average two to three years but they can live up to five years. Um, and the older they get, kind of the less productive they are, but typically around two to three years. All right, so we have our bottom, screen bottom board here, our deep uh, brood box or deep hive body. And then here we have what's called a medium honey super. Now you can get a shallow honey super or a medium honey super and uh, this box will go on top of this box and then this will all go on top of the bottom board and we'll put it all together but um, i choose a medium super to go on top of my deep brood box and i'm also going to leave this for the bees also okay that's kind of up to you to you but uh, i want to make sure that i'm leaving enough honey and enough uh it, you know resources for the bees to survive before I take the honey for myself because really the main uh, purpose that a bee when they get up and when they start their morning their purpose is to collect food and to build their population so they can make it through the winter that is really their main purpose in life so again in here we have 10 frames and you'll notice this one is not as big so this is a medium um, frame here with the wax foundation but I also have some here that I've had in hives before and this is a medium frame that's already drawn out you can even see this one still has a little nectar left in it and I'll store my frames in a freezer uh, if possible 
uh, but in a secure place because if you leave this put it in your building and in a dark place especially wax moss will find this and they will ruin your drawn out comb in no time so make sure that you take care of the drawn out comb that you have because as i said it's one of the most valuable uh things you need to 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 build a healthy colony of bees so that's how that goes and then this is a top screen here um some people have uh different things that they place on top like there's a top board that has a little circular hole in the center but i'm using this you can see more of that propolis here and it goes on to the hive on the top just like this. So um, the bees can't get out of there. And you can see they've tried to start putting this propolis around here because they're trying to seal it up and change the airflow and uh, just kind of get the conditions just right. Here. So here you have the top, okay? So then I just put this on. You'll notice these notches here. Um, that's so airflow can come in and out of the hive. And then you put your top on like that. And I guess we could have done this first, but and we'll put it on our book. Okay, so here we have a complete hive with a deep brood box, a medium super, and a top. And this is the landing pad here. Now this here is called an entrance reducer. Okay, so say you get a, a new package of bees and your the population is not that big. Um, they have to protect their hive, right? So if they have this open hole, it's easier for um, other colonies of bees to come in and rob their nectar or pollen, or even some type of predator, even like mice can get in here. So what you can do is you can insert this entrance reducer and you can have this small hole as the entrance. And that looks pretty small, but even a, a healthy uh, colony of bees can get in and out of there efficient enough you can change it to that which makes it a little bigger um, right now I'm leaving my entrances open because we are like prime time for the nectar flow so the bees here in Fort Mill and in, in our area in the southeast get most of their nectar and pollen from the tulip poplar the yellow poplar the tulip tree whatever you want to call it and luckily I have this beautiful forest behind my house and I have like one of the most massive tulip poplars around here, actually two of them. And there are lots of uh, their flowers falling off. So one second, let me grab one and show it to you. So you probably, maybe you might be noticing this in your own yard, but this is the flower from the tulip poplar and it's a major nectar producer so you see that beautiful orange color in there that is to attract pollinators okay and that word pollinators is a big deal so maybe we could talk a little bit about pollinators yes please tell us why bees are so important to us they really are so important the first thing i want to talk about is I think for people to really understand this, um, as a naturalist, this is what I do in my work. I share the wonders of nature with people and, and try to help them understand. You know, I grew up outdoors and in the woods and really in tune with nature, but a lot of people didn't grow up that way. So we can't just assume they already understand these things, but what we really need to understand is our connection to everything like everything on earth is connected it's the web of life basically humans are a strand in that web and i would say that honeybees um, all bees basically and all pollinators all animal pollinators are a very very significant strand in that web okay uh, people estimate that um 75% of all of the food, or 75% of the top 100 crops that we cultivate are pollinated by animal pollinators. Most of those are bees and insects, but also you have bats are pollinators, um, butterflies are pollinators. So there are lots of different types of bees, thousands of different species of bees. Um, I believe there are seven, seven different types of honeybees. 
And uh, what you'll find mostly here is the western honeybee. So pollination is, is extremely important for us, hence that connection in the whole web of life. So if we continue to, you know, create so much destruction to our environment and uh, really have a major impact on the places that bees can survive anymore, then it eventually is gonna have an impact on us. So these bees are major pollinators, okay? So what they do, what is pollinate, pollination, what is it? Well, plants, that's how plants reproduce. So you may have a male and a female part of a flower that don't touch. So something has to carry that pollen from one to the other. Some plants are pollinated by wind, but many plants are pollinated specifically by insects or bees or even a specific species because maybe like some flowers have to be pollinated by a hummingbird because they have that long beak so they can reach down into things and spread things. Um, bumblebees, for instance, um, are buzz pollinators. So they will get on a flower and they will create this vibration with their wing muscles that actually causes the pollen to explode you know you can look it up it's really cool so so they're taking that pollen from um, the the pistil or from the stamen which is the male reproductive part of a flower to another flower and then maybe a honeybee is not a buzz pollinator but they will collect all of that pollen on the hairs all over their body and they even have pollen sacks on their back legs it's kind of like cargo pants and they stuff the pollen down in there and uh, i can watch it my hives worker bees coming in with those pollen sacks full so they will just kind of take the pollen and it'll get shuffled around from the hairs and fibers on their body and that is essential for many of our flowering plants and fruits um, one third of the food on our table we would not have without animal pollinators. That is what they uh, estimate. And there are kind of different numbers out there, but these are pretty solid um, estimates, you know. Um, I, for instance, I just talked to my neighbor last week and he has lots of fruit trees in his yard. And for the past four years, I've had bees. I haven't talked to him in a while, but the, one of the first things he told me was, wow, like all of my plants are producing way more fruit since you have honeybees. And they also estimate that that can increase production for a lot of these plants that you and I live off of by as much as 70%. So that is extremely important, but it would be so easy to overlook. You could easily think, oh, look, these little insects, you know, they're not that big of a deal, but they are. A quote from Albert Einstein, he said that if honeybees or bees go extinct, humans will follow within four years. Now, I'm not sure if that's the exact number, but uh, Albert Einstein was a pretty smart fella. And I know that bees are really important to our life. So here's a question. Yes. Have local beekeepers, this is from Regina, have okay. local beekeepers been affected by colony collapse disorder? And if so, what steps have local beekeepers done to try to sidestep colony collapse Great disorder? Great question, thank you. <clears throat> um, that, that's a very important question because we do have lots of problems going on. Uh, major collapse of bee colonies everywhere. Uh, we're kind of, um, we're lucky here um, in South Carolina in the Southeast. We don't have a lot of these diseases that are very prevalent like foul brood, American foul brood. And there are several different other diseases bees can get. Um, we, we're not so prone to that here. Um, but these are insects, so there's always loss. For instance, last year I had three hives at one point. When I went into the winter, I came out of the winter with zero. And now I have three hives because I caught a swarm. I got um, a nuke or a nucleus of Russian bees. Actually, I do have, I have one hive that lasted from last year, I'm sorry, but it was a swarm. So um, this is a major problem. One, the most important thing we can do is educate ourselves as beekeepers. Like, it, it's great for everyone to uh, be interested in this and even, you know, have your own colonies of bees and beehives. But you just need to make sure that you educate yourself because careless beekeepers can be very dangerous. 
Um, if one person in our community is not taking care of their hives correctly, they could um, their bees could develop some type of disease and then they could spread it and it can just cause like major collapse of an entire area. So um, I'm not an expert on diseases and all of that, but I do know that compared to some parts of the country, we're in a pretty good place, but you still are going to experience loss. You have to expect that with bees. I mean, even uh, our biggest problems here are Varroa mites, which are um, parasitic, and uh, hive beetles are, are, but the Varroa mites are pretty much the biggest problem. And all bees, all colonies of bees will have Varroa mites, but uh, it just depends on at what level those bees are able to maintain that. Uh, some bees are more hygienic than others, and that's the reason I just got uh, a nuke of Russian bees this year, because they are said to be more adapted to deal with the varroa mites, and they're still pretty good honey producers. So where do you find your bees? Do you find swarms? Do you order them off of Amazon? How, how does someone... Yeah, it's pretty crazy. You can order bees, and they can come in the mail to you in a box um, with the queen in a little cage and a little can of, sh of sugar syrup to feed them. Um, you can purchase bees. I think a lot of people get bees from their local um, beekeeper co-op. So, you know, I'm part of uh, the South Carolina Beekeepers Association, and I took a beekeepers class. So the York County Beekeepers Association is always, every year they sell um, packages of bees. Uh, so at first we bought packages of bees. I kind of got into beekeeping with my two best friends. Probably watching right now, I hope they are. <laughs> Hopefully they'll ask me some tough questions. <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, so a lot of people buy packages of bees or you can get what's called a nuke. And a nuke is kind of like a small, hive of bees or colony that's already established with drawn out comb and a laying queen inside of it already um, but i'll be honest with you my luck with packaged bees has not been so great um, a lot of times they will just leave or maybe they won't accept the queen because it's kind of just uh, people will raise the queens and then they will put thousands of bees with that queen and there's a process when you put your package into your hive, um, the queen will be in her own little cage and you will kind of situate that cage into the hive and there's a candy plug on the end of the cage and it'll take about two or three days, three or four days for the worker bees to eat through that candy plug and then that will release the queen and hopefully during that two or three days, they've been around her pheromone enough to accept her as a queen. But that doesn't always happen. So I didn't have good luck really with packaged bees. So uh, what we're trying to do is catch swarms. Um, last summer between the three of us, we caught nine swarms. And a lot of people in the community have come to know that we are swarm catchers. If you happen to see a swarm of bees, like literally a big ball of bees on a tree branch or on a post or even on the ground sometimes, you don't have to be alarmed. Uh, when bees swarm, they're really calm, uh, they're not aggressive, and honeybees aren't aggressive um, for the most part anyway, unless you cause some type of problem with them. Uh, so swarms are where I get most of my bees, yeah. Okay, another question. Yep. How much honey can you expect a strong hive to produce in a season? This is from Chris. I think you know Chris. Chris Dobbins? Yeah. Oh, nice, Chris. <laughs> Maybe he can give me a little bit of that honey. He's got some good hives going over there. So uh, on a really strong hive, if you have a medium super like I do here, um, if they fill out all of those frames, I think they say you can get as much as 50 pounds from one medium super. So that's incredible, you know. Um, if you've got a really, really strong hive like Chris has over there, uh, he, I think he's got three medium supers on top of his. So. I mean, it's hard to tell how much you could get. Uh, and you know, you a lot of times, if it's a good year, you can harvest honey in the spring and again in the late summer. So if you've got ideal conditions and you know, like really healthy queen and bees, 
then I would say you could easily get 50 or 75 pounds off of one hive that's really doing well or one colony that's doing well. That's fascinating. Yeah. Can you show us your bees? Yes, I can. All right. But I don't, you know, when you say 50 or 75 <laughs> pounds, don't expect that, you know. These are really uh, volatile creatures and and we try a lot as much as we can to try to, you know, control them and make them produce as much as we can, but they, they are doing what they do, and I try to let them do what they do best. And I, like, one more thing I want to say is this super is left for my bees because they can fill this super up with honey completely, and I will leave it there for them. So they will survive through the winter. If you get too greedy and try to take all the honey that your bees are producing immediately, then uh, you're just really making it difficult for your bees to thrive. So I leave this and then any box that's added on top of that is where I will start to take honey. And a lot of people I know kind of practice in that way. All right, so I'm gonna get suited up here and uh, get my smoker going. And what we're gonna do is I have two more hives back here. We're just gonna go uh, check into one of those hives to see, uh, it, it's a new, it's the nucleus that I just bought a week and a half ago. And I wanna make sure that the queen is in there laying eggs. And so I'm gonna go in and just pull a frame out and maybe look for eggs, larvae. Um, and if you see the eggs, you know, you always want to see your queen, but if you see eggs, you know that the queen's doing her thing. You don't wanna disrupt them too much. When you're pulling frames out, you know you can injure or even kill your queen and it's just not worth the risk. All right, so All let's right. get ready. So tell us what you got going on here. So I have my smoker here. And uh, smoke is a, is anytime you're going into your, your uh, beehive and kind of taking things apart, it's a good idea to use smoke. Um, I do always. It kind of calms the bees. Um, some people say it, it kind of makes them go to eating, uh, but it definitely gives them a calming effect. And um, honeybees, you know, I tell some of my friends, like I'm a beekeeper and they're like, oh my goodness, they're afraid of bees. I don't know, maybe they watch too many movies. <laughs> Some bees are really uh, scary, like yellow jackets, which are kind of like not in the same order as honeybees, but they're very aggressive and they'll come after you for no reason. But honey, honeybees really won't do that. You could spend a whole day in my yard over here and even though I have three hives, you might not know it because most of the bees are just going straight up and they're going to forage primarily in these trees right now that popped up. You know, I used to think that in order to have uh, beehives or colonies, I needed to have like this huge farm with flowers everywhere, but that's not the case. Um, trees are where they get most of their sustenance from. And uh, thankfully I'm in the right place. <laughs> Chris, he's over in uh, Whiteville Park and you know, there's lots of big old growth trees there. Lots of people with flowers in their yard. All right, here we go. <laughs> Some of you are probably laughing out there now, aren't you? Okay. So these suits are good, you know. Typically when I get into uh, one of my hives, uh, most of the time they're really calm. If I do have any like excitement, it's usually just like one or two guard bees who will just start to buzz around here. Um, sometimes I could go into my hive without any protection on and be just fine, but it's just not really worth it uh, because once they start buzzing, your blood pressure goes up pretty quick. <laughs> but I will tell you, in um, the past four years in beekeeping, I've probably been stung only eight times. So, all right that's like what twice a year not too bad <laughs> so you know it's not a big deal and i'm the one working the hive so if you're just around bee colonies you really don't have much to worry about all right get a little more leaves here into my smoker <laughs> we'll go over here and check it out so here i have my hive tool uh this is an important thing to have and this is my bee brush um, you can kind of gingerly move the bees if you need 
but the smoke also works well for that um, if you want the bees to kind of move off of the top screen so you can pull it off you give them a little smoke and you'll see how that works all right, all right i'll be honest i'm a little nervous yeah well you know um, <laughs> i have respect for the bees i respect that but uh you'll see it'll be pretty calm and laid back and hopefully lots of folks can uh, gain a new perspective on that too so you never want to stand in front of the entrance so Good what we're to going know. to do is if you just want to be there to the side yep and i could come up here anytime with no protection on, stand here close and watch what my bees are taking in and out of the hive, and they won't bother me. But if you get all up in the entrance, you might have a problem. Behind the hive is where you want to uh, be when you're working your hive. Are they territorial? Uh, bees are not so territorial. No, they uh, they kind of share um, pollen and nectar sources pretty well, I believe. Now, if another bee tries to come into their Hive, yeah, it's a different story. All right, so I'm just gonna crack my lid here and just add a little smoke so that they'll kind of get off that top screen. And, um, you know, it's typically a good idea to uh, work your hives um, in the middle of the day uh, because a lot of those worker bees are out foraging. And you'll notice there are not a lot of bees in here. Um, a lot of them are out foraging right now. And as I said, this was just a nucleus that came with four drawn out um, frames. You can see that. You got a little uh, work going on next door, but hopefully you can hear me good. So I'm going to pop this screen off. Everything I do in my hives, I'll be very gentle, okay? okay. I'm just going to pop this off. You can see not going to change much behavior. And then I'll just lay this over here. And this was a new top screen. You can see some propolis are starting to build there. But a lot of times they will concentrate their brood in the center and work out. So the center frames a lot of times will be where you'll have the eggs and the brood being laid. And then the outer frames, the further you go out, lots of times you'll see more honey and pollen stored there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this frame out on the end here just to give me a little space when I'm pulling out a frame because I don't want to uh, I don't want to damage or, or hurt my queen. That's the main thing. So I'm just going to take one of these out to give me a little space. And this is, like I said, uh, this is a small number of bees and a typical hive you can have anywhere from or a typical colony you can have anywhere from 10,000 to about 60,000 bees now on your earlier hive well you didn't have all your frames in on the earlier hive so they do they typically fit in as tightly as that frame did yes so okay. this is a 10 frame um, body so that's how they fit in there just about right there's a little bit of space and each frame is built to give the perfect amount of space in between them. These little notches right here um, give the perfect B space. I want to say that B space is three eighths of an inch. And that was developed or kind of discovered by Langstroth who made this hive and that really revolutionized beekeeping. All right, so here we go. I'm gonna just Gently pull this frame out. Now look how calm these bees are, right? Mm -hmm. You can't hear any swarming. There's nothing crazy going on. But I can look in here and see what's going on. This is good. I see lots of nectar. You see the shiny liquid inside those cells. You'll also see that yellow and orange, and that is pollen. You'll see all different colors of pollen depending on what plant they get it from and uh, that provides them with lots of protein. So this frame, you can see, was the, the foundation um, was that black plastic. You see there where my index uh -huh. finger is. So they built off of that just fine. I don't see the queen on this frame and I don't expect to because I don't see any eggs. So she's spending her time mostly laying eggs on some of these other frames. And while we're here, we should just go ahead and 
try to see if we can find some brood. All right. It's got to be easy, patient, take your time, stay calm. Sometimes they'll get a little aggravated and you'll start to hear them, hear the noise of a little buzzing. But if you stay calm and you don't want to smash a bee, like if I can come into my hive and not smash one bee, then that's the best way to keep them calm like this because when you smash a bee, it releases that defensive pheromone and the other bees will catch on that something's wrong. Oh yeah, now this is what I wanted to see, okay? So those capped cells there that you're seeing, that is capped brood. So that means the queen has laid eggs. It's moved, it's moved from the uh, larvae to the pupa state, then they cap it. And then eventually these bees will hatch. They will chew that cap off from the inside out and hatch out of there. Now, if you look closely here, let me see. I saw some larvae. Yeah, all right, so we'll just go up here. If I just put my finger there, they'll kind of move around. And you look on the outer part. I don't know if you can see inside any of those cells. Let me try to get a little more light in there for you. So, there. Can you kind of... There are larvae in there. They're like kind of like like a little white worm i think uh, you can probably see them now at some point but that's great so what that tells me is that the queen is in here hopefully if i go around the outer edges i see um, smaller larvae that's only like within the first two days and then around the edges i see eggs as well and my queen seems to be laying in a good pattern Typically, the center of the frame is where you'll have most of the brood. And then as you move out, you'll find nectar and pollen on the outer edges to keep those fed. All right. So I'm going to put this one back in quickly. And then how about we just pull one more out and check it. And if the queen's on there, then maybe we'll see her. But if not, we'll let her be. So do we have any other questions out there or uh, comments? Chris says you have a nice brood. Yeah, it's <laughs> looking good. Someone asked, is there some place local, Beverly asked, is there a club or a group in Fort Mill for beekeeping? There sure is a, a club. Um, I don't have the information on it, but um, I, I've been to a few meetings in the past few years. So I bet the Greenway, oh look, this bee is doing the waggle dance. So you see him waggling back and forth. So that bee is communicating to these other bees where to find a source of nectar or pollen. So I'm telling you, these bees are incredible. They're super smart. They will go out and find a source of nectar or pollen, come back, and they do this little figure eight dance and um, within that dance, there are signs for the other bees to pick up on. It tells them lots of information. It tells them how far away the source of pollen or nectar is. Now check this bee here out. Has his pollen sacs are full there. You this see that too, beautiful? Right? Yep, yep. And um, see so those, those little bumps on his side, right? Yeah, like that one there, and then this one here. So in a different color too, from a different plant. So this is looking great. You see all of that brood, good pattern. So that tells me that my is doing her job. And now, you know, a lot of times, like I said, you want to keep looking, you want to see that queen. But what I'm going to do is put this back because I've already seen evidence of that queen. And the last thing I want to do is cause her any harm just because I wanted to see her. Um, when I first moved these frames into this hive from the nucleus i did see that queen and she was really good and healthy so now these bees have been in here for about a week and a half so now that they have more space and more drawn out comb hopefully
hopefully that queen is going to continue to lay more and more eggs and then in the next two to three weeks this hive will start to explode as far as the population thousands of bees hatching every day all right and you typically want to put your frames back in the same order that you take them out um, I mean, there are times when you split hives and you add frames in to, to other hives, but um, if you're working with the same frames, I typically would recommend to put them in just like you found them. Okay. Well, what can we do just as a general community beyond education to help the, the bee population thrive? That's a great question, right? Because they need our help. Because what we're doing in a major way is we're destroying a lot of their habitat, okay? So with all of this growth and progress comes some uh, effects and honeybees are feeling the effects of that for sure. So um, a couple things you could do is you could plant pollinator friendly plants. Um, there are lots of lists online. I recommend planting native plants, all right? Native plants are better. There are lots of invasive species. I think we just had a, a virtual speaker talk mm -hmm. about invasive species uh, the other day, but um, lots of good plants. I mean, you can plant some ideas for plants that you can plant in your yard, and you don't really wanna just like spread them out like one plant here and one over there. It's best to do like big bunches of plants, maybe four or five feet wide, so the bees can locate it and then once they get there they're more efficient uh, at their collection because they're going to do everything as efficiently as they can um bee balm is a good one golden rod is a good one um if you have the tulip poplar around you you're in good shape uh ask we should tell chris to make us a list of his <laughs> top five Chris is really good with plants. His dad's a botanist. So, Chris, why don't you just tell us five of your favorite plants? <laughs> but I do know bee balm, goldenrod. I have written down a few. Um, you know, later on, the clover. You're, you know, we all like to manicure our lawns and cut everything down, but maybe you could leave some patches for your bees. And if you want to make your home or, or where you're at a good, a uh, place for bees to be welcomed. There are a couple of things, you, they're kind of like us. They need food, water, and shelter, okay? So if you have, like I have some bird baths around and little places where there's a bit of standing water. Now bees, uh, they don't just land on the water and drink it up. Um, a lot of times, like in my bird bath, I put sticks and maybe rocks in there and they'll land on the stick and then kind of get the water from the stick rather than just like gulping it up and they'll drown if they get in it so or they could so you want to have water somewhere and then you want to have the right habitat so they're not only honeybees living here but they're all different types of bees some bees live in the ground and burrow in the ground so you might want to uh, leave some spaces that aren't covered in mulch where bees can um, live in the ground you also have a lot of carpenter bees around right now i'm sure people are seeing that and uh, some people consider them to be pests but you can just leave for instance like if you look right here there's a stack of old kind of rotten logs that's a perfect place uh, for carpenter bees and other types of wasps and hornets to make a nest i've got tons of carpenter bees around here um, carpenter bees are often confused with bumblebees um, bumblebees do live in colonies but carpenter bees don't they they will drill a hole into the wood and then they will lay maybe five or six eggs inside their tunnel and then they'll take care and raise those babies up but yeah so you can have um leave some some natural areas where flowers can grow and plant the right plants and um pesticides is another thing okay uh, for instance right here where we're standing i have gravel you see the easiest way for me to manage all of these weeds in this gravel would be to take my weed whacker and come through here, or I mean, I'm sorry, 
to spray it, right, with a pesticide. So I could come through here and spray all of this, and bam, I wouldn't have to cut these weeds. But I'm spreading deadly chemicals everywhere. So I know that people are going to use pesticides, so just please be mindful of that. Uh, limit your use of pesticides. Think about your neighbors and where you're spraying it, and just try to limit it. And it's also a good idea to apply any type of pesticide in the evening or at night when bees aren't out foraging. Um, and there are also some other organic methods of getting rid of those things. You know, if a, if a chemical kills bugs, then we're pretty much just a big bug. You know what I'm saying? So the more of that stuff that we put into our environment, into our groundwater, into everything, uh, I think it starts to have a, an effect. So just be mindful of that. Okay, a couple more questions. Yep. What could you do if you didn't have a good laying pattern or eggs in your, in your hive? Oh, okay, so if I didn't have a good laying pattern, then that would, get, that would be a sign that my queen is failing or that my queen is not healthy. So a lot of times bees, the honeybees will recognize that themselves and they will create what's called a supersedure cell. And that is basically a cell to raise a new queen. All right, to replace the queen that they have. Um, they also create queen cells when they swarm. That's because they know that they've overgrown their, their home and they need to, uh, they, they're overpopulated their hive. So they'll quick create a queen cell on the bottom typically of a frame. And then they'll create actually multiple queen cells. The first queen to hatch will come out of her queen cell and she will go around and try to kill the other She'll open up the other queen cells and kill those other queens. And then the old queen will take roughly half of those bees and they will swarm and the new queen will stay there. So is that why bees leave the hive and swarm? Yes. Because a queen has failed? No. No. It is not. It is because that is how they um, spread. That okay. is how they increase and create a new colony. So one colony outgrows its home. They, they catch on to that, um, the, they start to release a pheromone inside the hive, and once they have decided they're gonna swarm, there's not really much you can do about it, and they'll create that queen cell. It'll take 16, 17 days for that queen to hatch. So once that queen hatches, she will also have to go out and mate. So she will go out and find drones will, um, drones will congregate together in, uh, in the same place, and a queen bee will will find those drone congregation sites and fly right through it and then the drones will chase after her so the strongest fastest drones will catch her and mate her she will mate up to 20 drones in her uh, mating flights which could be a couple times uh, within the first two weeks and then after she mates with the drone uh, when they when they um, disconnect from each other uh, it pulls the entrails of the male out and the male just falls to the ground and dies So then she'll find another male and mate to ensure that she's fertilized So then she can lay fertilized eggs that can then produce um, Another queen so if the if the bees want to create another queen in a swarm cell They will feed it royal jelly, but it has to be a fertilized egg from a queen sometimes when you have uh, lost your queen in your hive you may have laying worker bees and they'll start to lay eggs but you can notice the, the eggs won't be in the center of the cell there may be multiple eggs in one cell and it's kind of easy to tell about that okay last question yep. um, what are some benefits of buying local honey versus honey made elsewhere okay good question uh, local honey I would say is definitely the best because um, it, it really can help with allergies and if you have allergies to your local area then you definitely want to get uh, the, the honey that's been made from your, the plants local to you. Um, also you're supporting local small businesses so that's a great thing and um, I think in the past couple years there's been a problem with this you know like big uh, big companies that produce lots of honey you know there was some honey that was coming in it wasn't that was being diluted so you know find a local beekeeper or a local apiary and uh, support those people you know that's a, a very important thing to do especially in times like these yep. all right okay well Jared thank you so much 
All right, yes. <laughs> Thank you so much for speaking with us about bees. My pleasure. And um, this video will be posted to our Facebook page. And if you have more questions, let us know. We'd love to get you the information. And for any questions that we didn't get answered today, reach out to us. Again, we'll get you the information and the resources you asked for. Thanks so much. Yes, thanks for joining. See you. Have a great day. Bye-bye.